Greetings, young scholars. Dr. Williams here with the exciting lecture on chapter nine, which is the next chapter that we're going to be covering on social commerce. So let's start with what is social commerce? E-commerce is broadly selling things on the internet. Right, so Walmart participates in e-commerce. You go to their site, you can shop around, and you can buy things. Social commerce is a subset of that, where we're using social media to uh, facilitate online shoppers uh, to purchase via social media. So that's, that's the difference between e-commerce and social commerce, e-commerce being a subset, you know, uh, Walmart also has uh, uh, social commerce uh, sites, as does Target and some of the others. So when we use social media, not for, uh, you know, silly memes and foolishness uh, of our dogs, then uh, we're using a commercial application to drive the acquisition of new customers and retain old customers, then we're participating uh, social commerce. Social shopping is when the consumers uh, participating in you know every shop online shopping or social commerce shopping is the same as or social media shopping is the same as shopping, right? It's just doing it via social media. So uh, when we use social media for that commercial application to get customers or retain customers, then we're participating in that area. So key social commerce elements, ratings and reviews. Nearly every social media shopping site uh, has a section for allow you to rate and review. And also, if you ever if you don't do that, uh, places for you to read ratings and reviews. We'll come around to that in a minute again. Curated merchandise. Merchandise. Uh, Pinterest is an example of curated merchandise. If you follow people uh, that you like on Pinterest and they post things, you go, "Oh, look at there!" Uh, it's generally that that item's available, you know, from Etsy or some other place. Uh, or it can be more structured like uh, Stitch Fix, where they kind of uh, algorithmically get to know your what you like and don't like clothing-wise, and they send you clothes that they think you like. They curate those clothes, so you don't have to go through the entire Macy's website. They're going to cut that out and curate the merchandise for you. And then shopping applications and menus. Amazon. Uh, is an online spot, even with some brick and mortar stores for the food side. So uh, that's probably the most popular shopping application. But Best Buy and Simply Mac also, they have brick and mortar stores, but you can also participate uh, online with them. And they have uh, customer groups that are fans of theirs and uh, that you can follow. and get special deals or see what's the, the newest thing that's uh, coming into either of those. So those are the key items that typically you're going to have when you're talking about, uh, when we're talking about social media commerce or social, social commerce. So this example is uh, Dave who has forgotten that he needs to, you know, send his mother some Mother's Day flowers. And he's scrolling through um, Instagram, Facebook, and because it's Mother's Day is coming up, uh, they they bought ads uh, on the social media platforms. I go, oh, I need to send some other. So I click on one, but I've got to head off to a meeting or something. So I might just use the chat bot that comes up on most sites. Everybody's familiar with those. Said, you know, you can call, you can chat with us right now. Of course, you're not really chatting with a human. You're chatting with a, you know, a system. Try to keep it right place so you can call. 
but uh, so I do that and I buy it and automatically uh, puts a post right on my Facebook page advertise for them and so that's just kind of a little uh, diagram that the authors put together to kind of show how the cycle uh, works typically or can work so shopping online no matter how you do it is still shopping now if you remember from your principles of marketing course where we talked about the consumer decision-making process is the same here but uh, with that applicability to social media shopping right so we have the classic steps which that second bubble is jacked up but you know you recognize you have a problem or you somehow and then you go on an information search so whether you say you're looking for a car and you need a car you go on an information search about cars and then you uh, come up with a consideration set of a few two three cars and then you evaluate those based on how much you want to spend how much they are what kind of financing is what colors they are where they are all that kind of thing and then you buy and then you evaluate the purchase after you buy so the purchase is not uh, the end of it so in this scenario since it's social media marketing is of course we apply those same steps to social commerce so number one you recognize that you have a problem so let's so you can see a social an ad on Instagram like I did for this thing uh, it's a rig where uh, if you're hanging pictures the picture on the left I mean uh, you can you know maybe you have a picture that has a, a wire on the back of it and one that has a bracket on the back of it and you want it to be uh, level that's always been a pain in the neck for me and I saw this thing on Instagram where you can uh, hang the picture uh, you know it has a wire for example you can hang it there uh, I say there I mean there and it has a level on the left and one at the top that I've cut off and uh, you, know, you get it level and get it where you want it you know as far as on the wall and then you you press this little button right here and it makes an indentation on the wall and that's where you put the screw um, and then if you have a bracket yeah it's easier you can just uh, you can hang the bracket on there too or you can just hold it up on the wall where it's level that one and we'll do it so <clears throat> you know ads if you remember uh, and marketing ads can uh, remind, inform, or persuade. So in this case, it, it informed me that something was out there that would save that pain in the neck that I have. So we have a, you have a problem. You either you know you recognize you have a problem, and you go looking for things, or something comes up that reminds you that you have a problem. In each one, <clears throat> then you go on information search. So how do we do that? Well, if I'm in Spartanburg, South Carolina, I will, uh, and I'm looking for barbecue, I'll go to Yelp and let it use geolocation and find out what barbecue joints are around me while I'm riding down the road and I'll pick one, get directions and go there. Uh, that could be one. Uh, comments that people make on social media about, you know, Spirit Airlines uh, really stinks or Delta Airlines really stinks or whatever. You can get this from somebody that you trust that you know. You can search social media, you know, with hashtags, or if you know the name of the brand you're looking for. Uh, you can see people's, you know, a wedding wish list or a gift registry for a birthday or something, and go, yeah, I didn't even know they made that Dyson vacuum cleaner. I mean, I need one of those. Again, you have it for my own life. So we, <clears throat> the information search after that, <clears throat> I inserted one in here. The uh, probably should have been maybe elsewhere, but uh, 
used and uh, lectured about in uh, the consumer purchase behavior, the first moment of truth and the second moment of truth. The first moment of truth being the time uh, a customer removes the good, chooses a, a particular brand off the shelf. Let's say we'll use your grocery store here and puts it in the cart because they have a cart picture there. Second moment of truth is when the customer uses it and uh, and they feel they're satisfied or they're dissatisfied with it. They bought some tomatoes, a new different brand, they get it home, uh, dissatisfied with them. They might say something about it on social media, but in the end, they're probably not going to rebuy that brand. But um, the zero moment of truth is kind of a, is a newer concept and emphasizes that consumers today might be influenced in several moments prior to making a purchase decision. And they might be influenced several different times online, including social media. So before they even get in the store, they may have already, uh, they may already have a preference for one brand over another because of things that have hit them while they're on social media. So information's everywhere. Most people don't find out about things in a grocery store when they get in there. Now you may, and end caps are constructed uh, that way and uh, shelf hangers and all those things. But so in addition to the first moment of truth and second moment of truth, marketing has now added the zero moment of truth and that you need to pay attention to because uh, there's so much uh, information online, just on the web and especially via social media. So <clears throat> that leads us to ratings and reviews. Now this 82% uh, seek out negative reviews as an indicator of authenticity. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that if you, I was looking for a bracket to mount to a mic stand that I could mount an iPad to for uh, chords, lyrics, different things when playing music to replace my big three ring binder of greatness. And uh, so I went looking for one the other day and found one I thought I liked. Well, I went right to the reviews. Well, let's say there were 20 and they were all positive. Well, that might lead me to believe that, that uh, Guitar Center might be uh, curating those reviews and keeping the negative ones out. Because nobody is 100%, uh, take 100 people that buy uh, Clorox, somebody going to complain that they didn't like it for some reason. Right? So <clears throat> you want to make sure that you listen to and respond to negative commentary if you're a marketer, but you don't want to curate them out where they never appear because that looks bogus. And we call that source credibility. And if you're, if you're rating site, if you think the source credibility of the Amazon uh, customer rating site is bogus, then you might not shop at Amazon anymore because you just feel like, you know, you can't trust it. Anymore. But they're very powerful and marketers that don't allow commentary or make it so hard to leave ratings and commentary that nobody does, uh, they should be suspect. They should make it easy for people to do it. And take the good with the bad. Listen and respond to the bad. Also, listen and respond to the good. If you like it, you might turn them into a bit of an evangelist. Excuse me, uh, I coughed, but I'm not sick. So moving on to stage three of the consumer buying process, the evaluation of alternatives, right? So social media can make that easier than it was 30 years ago. I have a Target circle logo up there because Target had an app for years called 
whether you move it or not. The cartwheel was great because if you're in a target and let's say you wanted to buy some uh, facial tissues or you know Kleenex. So you decide I'm going to buy this brand of puffs. You could on your phone scan it and the cartwheel app would say uh, there's a 30% off Kleenex which is a similar item to this and it might be right next to it on the shelf or maybe down a little bit and you go oh well I'll take uh, Kleenex is fine with me I'm not brand loyal to puffs and I get them for 30% less it would just tell you right then in the store so you didn't have to coupon shop or take coupons with you or anything sometimes you scan something and uh, let's say you scan Diet Coke and they'll say oh well, you know the Diet Dr. Thunder is on sale or something, but yeah, I'm brand loyal. I want Diet Coke, so that's not going to help me. But you know, notebook paper, I'm thinking computer paper, all sorts of stuff. I use that in Target for a long time. Uh, they've now migrated that to a thing called Circle, which still allows you to scan products and it'll tell you if that's the best deal on that cleaning fluid or whatever you're buying or not. And it gives you other, uh, other benefits as well. But that's an example of a, an app uh, that can that can help with evaluation of alternatives that again wasn't available decades ago, and uh, you can a lot of people and it's human nature that you know you look at recommended recommendations and testimonials, and uh, you say well I might prefer this brand of uh, iPad bracket to this brand based on what these people say. Or, you know, when you're on Amazon and you buy something, and then it says, uh, people uh, like you who bought this also were in fees. And that's called an expert or recommendation agent or an expert recommending system. Uh, and that falls in this category too of valuation alternatives. Just so different ways that, that social media and the internet have, have made this stage. Uh, very much uh, full of information more than it was some time back. So stage four, that's when you purchase, you hope that the consumer purchases. So they might buy it on Facebook, might buy it from an ad on Instagram, they might use Instashop, right? They might, you can buy from any of those. They might go to a social shopping mall and, uh, I've listed one here. I don't know if anybody's ever visited it, but it's fun uh, because it has, in addition to big boy retailer, it has the, let's say that it, it's the internet, or let's say it's Google Shopping blended with Etsy. So there's all sorts of uh, niche companies in there too. And you can, uh, like all the social, there's other ones, but that's, I think this is the biggest one. And uh, a social shopping mall. And uh, it's fun, so uh, or it's interesting, and I've bought stuff off there because it's, you know, they have so many things, and if you're looking for something particular or something special for somebody, they won't find the local Walmart or Target, then it's a good place to go. Etsy is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. I paint a picture, put it on Etsy, somebody buys it. That would never happen because I have no talent in painting. That was just an example. Groupon, Living Social, Group Buys, or again, Chatbot Services, which they categorize as conversational commerce. So in the purchase uh, decision, uh, you know, if we're shopping for a car, we just buy the car. So, uh, and we buy it at the dealership. I guess you could buy some online. Uh, there are many online, or not many, but several online car shopping services. But if you read reviews of those, they're less than stellar. The reason I haven't ever done it. Uh, more negative than positive. In fact, it's hard to find a positive, uh, a positive post. But anyway, the purchase decision can be facilitated by social media and social commerce in that way. And then after the purchase, you know, does it work for you? Does it not work like it's supposed to? Is it, do you feel like you paid too much for it in retrospect? To put you in a bind? Is it complicated? You can't figure 
right? So you could post, you know, reviews, positive or negative, your experiences with it. You could really go all at it, really attack them because it's no good. Uh, and all that is facilitated by social commerce tools. Um, yeah, most people complain, not a lot of people share kudos. So uh, you should reasonably expect there to be more negative than positive, but uh, you know, there's more positive than negative. That's generally a pretty good sign. So you could do that uh, several different ways using social media commerce tools. So just to hit back one more time, we get a stimulus, something happens, my computer breaks, or we're reminded that it's a pain in the neck hanging pictures that have different hanging mechanisms on the back or whatever. Typically, uh, classically, you would go shopping at, uh, you know, Target, you have something you think you like, you take it off the shelf, uh, you, you buy it, you get it home, you use it. And then if it really trips your trigger, you might turn into uh, the biggest fan of that product in the world and tell people verbally, but also you might get wild and post a picture of it on Instagram and talk about how great it is. I bought a uh, Roomba that uh, automatically maps your house and then you can tell it, say, you know, Monday's back in the kitchen, on Tuesday's back in the dining room, on Wednesday's back in the living room, and it just does it automatically. And when it gets full, it goes back to its home base and empties itself and goes back out again. And uh, it is awesome. And anytime I get a chance to bring it up, I do. And I post a video of it, and I love it. I am a brand ambassador for that uh, automatic Roomba. It is a life changer. Uh, also, the Dyson uh, V5, which I'd like to have a V7, now I have a V5, that's another thing. Uh, but anyway, but before those, we may know a lot about the product from social media. We may ask people, anybody ever bought one of these and see what people say or whatever, and that's the concept of zero moment of truth. Before you get to the store, before you get it home and try it, and uh, and either like it or hate it, you become an evangelist or an enemy of the brand or the product or the category even. So that's what we call the third moment of truth, what we call, you know, you become an advocate for the product. And that's what we as marketers, what you would like all of your customers to be. So what are some best practices? Take all comments, even if they hate you. If you got incentivized opinions or you invite opinions, you need to disclose that. The person that's doing it should disclose it. But if not, the site needs to disclose it so that you know. Just like on Google, you search and, you know, the top gets our ads. Uh, you know that because they say that. Um, advocacy is what you're looking for. And, uh, that lets people rate the value in the review. Some people you'll see, they go, well, this guy is just an idiot. And I don't place any, I don't place any. Uh, I saw one the other day where somebody said, this person posts negatively about every restaurant he eats at on Yelp. So ignore it. And uh, so somebody went and looked around and saw that one particular person really wore out the restaurants. Uh, so it might not be useful. And there should be some way to weed those out. And several sites do have software that weeds those out or marks them as people have found this one to be not very valuable. Uh, encourage people to review and thank them when they do. You know, you could, uh, you could give me free shipping on the next order if I review, no matter what it is. Right. Uh, or you could just ask people to a lot of business on Amazon will send you emails. Uh, one thing that's a pain in the neck is when you know an, an app comes up and you say, yeah, I like it, five stars. Would you like to write a review? Sometimes I go, yeah, you write a review, but you have to go through, you have to remember to log in for various things and all that. I don't do it. Make it easy on people. They'll do more of it. If you make air conditioning filters easy to change, people will change their air conditioning filter more. Make it easy. People are prone to do more of it.
was my point there. You can, you know, if you uh, shop at Amazon a lot, you can download, uh, you know, a toolbar add-on. It makes it easy for you to do. You just click it, it has all your things there, and you can, has all your recent purchases, you can go in there and rate them. If it means that much to you. It doesn't mean that much to a lot of people. If they order it, and they get it, and it works, and they like it, they just carry on. They'll buy it again, but uh, they generally won't say a lot about it because, you know, time and money are scarce resources. Speaking of uh, scarce resources, how can marketers build a base of authentic good reviews? Educate, identify people most likely to share opinions, right? Especially mavens, uh, market mavens we've talked about before, and uh, make it easy. And uh, don't let people call you on the phone when you record a lecture. Um, see where they do it and listen. And you know, the last uh, exam included social media listening um, topics and questions. We talked about that earlier in the course, but if they're supporters, good. If they're detractors, that's fine. Tell me you are working on that and you apologize. You want to fix it. Go back next time and you, you get a free drink if it's a restaurant or neutral, whatever they are. Uh, you might not want to respond to all of them, but uh, you know, respond to some of them, especially with a non-automated message. Automated messages can get you in the terrible trouble. Somebody can complain that their service was slow or somebody can complain that uh, they died in your restaurant because service was slow. And the algorithm might just kick back the same response and go, we're sorry to hear about that. How about a uh, free salad next time you come? You know, you go, well, I'm dead. You know, I can't eat it. You know, several levels of that uh, in the marketing literature. So the automated responding, it can be all right, but uh, it can also get companies into a lot of trouble. So the psychology of influence. We're really interested in what goes on. Uh, in a consumer's mind, that black box, and what can make a consumer more likely or less likely, right, that they will buy, or at least include you, or include a business or a firm or a school in their consideration set. So <clears throat> the second bullet point there mentions bounded rationality. What is bounded rationality. Well, it's the problem that humans face when they have choices to make but are limited by their own cognitive ability or capacity. In other words, they they only know so much. So they get hard for them to make a decision when it's a complex I must say. And um, their choices to make but they're Really understand, feel like they understand them well enough. Information overload, we've all experienced that when there's just too much data to handle. You know, one of the best ways to learn when I was in sales to lose a sale is to give too much information. If you make them read a three page paper about how the product is and what they should do, oftentimes you'll lose those uh, because people just don't have that much time. Even though, yeah, well, we're being completely transparent and sharing all the information about the product or service. And yeah, that's generally too much. Heuristics, those are shortcuts that uh, humans make in their brains so they don't have to start every decision over at zero. Right? It could be your heuristic could be that I've uh, enjoyed many Diet Cokes. I like them. I'm going to buy Diet Cokes. I don't need to shop for all the different variables. I know I like it. I'm going to get it. Or I've had previous experience with a brand. Or I know that uh, Uncle Billy uses that, and uh, he's an idiot. So it must not be very good. Think of those heuristics as uh, shortcuts, which include satisficing, which is when you collect information, on a 
and you start to collect information about it. And maybe it's too expensive to get every piece of information. Or maybe you just don't have the time or the cognitive ability to collect or understand every piece of information about it. So you make a decision that's acceptable to you. It's maybe not the best decision, but you invest enough effort to where it's an acceptable decision. You're going to buy it. You think it's going to work pretty good. It's not going to burn your house down or kill you. And I'm going to buy it. And thin slicing, which is using heuristics to simplify decision making process, similar to what we just uh, discussed. So, what are the sources? Of, uh, you know, we're talking about influencing our things. Uh, what are some sources of things that might influence a consumer? The proof is the first one, right? So, a lot of people you know selecting a particular type of our clothing or so you interpret that popularity as social proof that that's the right choice. All these people wouldn't be doing that if it wasn't the right choice. So that's a, that's a source, social proof. Then we've got authority. There's an expert in the field, in your opinion, and they recommend product A or service A. So, uh, that's persuasive to you. Uh, that might influence you toward a uh, purchase over one good over another. Affinity is in sports marketing. We say one of the things that sports marketing has over other fields of marketing is the affinity advantage. In other words, even if the Green Bay Packers have not won a Super Bowl in tears, uh, they'll still sell out every game when the <clears throat> when the season begins, if it ever begins this year. Um, because people like the Green Bay Packers, whether they win the Super Bowl or not. So you could call that liking if you want to. Uh, people tend to follow and emulate uh, people whom they find attractive or otherwise desirable. So if you like somebody, male or female, or you think highly of somebody, and you know you think they're a sharp dresser and you see them wearing a certain kind of jacket, that might influence you to buy that kind of jacket. Scarcity. If you think something's running out, uh, you might have a lot to buy it. In the case of the COVID-19 uh, rush on toilet paper, there's a good example. Uh, you know, people could, uh, I was talking to a friend yesterday, they went to a uh, Dunkin' Donuts and uh, bought something and the person and the uh, first day of the order gave them a roll of toilet paper along with their coffee and their ice mochaccino or whatever they got. I thought that was uh, pretty funny. But you'll even pay a premium for something that you think is scarce. That's the reason that luxury automobiles like to have fewer numbers of dealerships. Now when people see one they go, oh look, uh, there's one. They don't have any of those in my state. I think I'll buy one. All right, you got to get on a list for a Tesla. They must be great. I think I might buy one. That can influence you. Reciprocity. Uh, that's when you have a an urge to repay debts and favors, whether or not we requested to help. Somebody helped you out. Uh, my buddy up the street uh, has helped out philanthropic causes I've been involved in. Uh, raising money for different things, and he spent his career with Subaru of America, so I will always own Subaru, and I do now. I try and back on. Uh, he didn't require it, asked me to. I just, I just do. So that can influence you reciprocity, unless you're a hard holder soul and you don't ever think about what people have done for you. In which case, that wouldn't influence you. Inconsistency. Right, uh, and inconsistency, we could also put a, a line out there and write cognitive dissonance. And if you remember cognitive dissonance, about smart. 
evaluation stage. You know, that's when that's that psychological discomfort caused when things we know or do contradict one another. So we we buy something and then we we find out that uh, that the company treats their employees terribly. And in your mind, you say, well, I like the product, but I don't like that background on the firm. So that can influence you to take it back, not buy it in the first place or not buy it again. So these are six sources of influence that the authors uh, list in the book. And there are others, but I call these the big six. This chart's in the textbook. It's kind of a breakdown on different shopping tools and uh, where they fall uh, in these influence factors. So you can see, uh, let's take uh, scarcity right here. So, um, you know, you only have uh, deal feeds like if like you go to Uber Eats, it'll say, you know, if you want to jump onto these five restaurants, we've got pick up scheduled all five of them. So if you choose one of these in the next five minutes, then there's no delivery charge, right? So you got to move quick because it's going to move on. The list is going to change. Um, example, our geolocation promotions, you're in a shopping center and it says, you know, Target is, is going to deal for the next 30 minutes on whatever, washing detergent, right? You got to move fast. You know, you got to get it. But anyway, you, see, you can just see, you can apply, uh, you see for social proof, you got recommendations from people, reviews, maybe people that you like, maybe somebody that you look up to or respect for their abilities or knowledge about technology has shared that they've recently bought a certain class of electronics and they shared it on their page or that same person wrote a testimony. I've been using this video camera for years or whatever. Uh, that kind of stuff. All right. So that completes the lecture on chapter nine. All right. I'll see you online.